In the last presentation, we looked at how to calculate a representative reaction rate for any reaction. And a major part of kinetics is the study of the factors that can affect these measured reaction rates. Chemists are interested in figuring out how they can increase the rates of desirable reactions while decreasing the rates of undesirable ones. Over the next few lessons, we're going to look at several factors that can affect reaction rates. Rate laws are the primary way we quantify the effect of these factors on reaction rate. And the first factor that we're going to look at will be the concentration of the reactants. Generally, the larger the concentration of the reactant molecules available to react, the faster the reaction rate. And this is because larger concentrations increase the number of collisions or contact that can occur between the reactant molecules. The increased frequency of reactant molecule contact means we produce product molecules more quickly. And when we talk about concentration, we're generally discussing concentration in terms of either molarity for solutions in units of moles per liter, or for gases, we're talking about partial pressure. The rate law is the mathematical relationship between the rate of the reaction and the concentration of the reactants. This is an experimentally determined relationship, and we'll talk about how we determine it in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the general form of the rate law. So in any rate law, the rate of the reaction that we measure experimentally is directly proportional to the concentration of each reactant raised to a power. So if we look at a generic reaction that starts with reactants A, and B. Our rate law would be the rate is equal to an experimentally determined rate constant, which is labeled K, times the concentration of our first reactant A raised to a power N. So we're just using a general variable here, N. It's going to stand for a number that we experimentally determine. We're going to multiply this by the concentration of our second reactant, B, raised to a different experimentally determined exponent. So these exponents, N and M, are called orders for the reaction. You'll hear reaction order discussed in two contexts. The individual exponent on each reaction is called the order with respect to that reactant. In some cases, though, we also talk about the overall order of the reaction, and that's the sum of all of the individual reactant orders on each of the reactants. So let's look at an example of this. For the following reaction between nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas, the experimentally determined rate law is that the rate is equal to the rate constant K times the concentration of our first reactant NO raised to an experimentally determined rate order of two. We say that this reaction is second order with respect to NO, to nitrogen monoxide. This is multiplied by the concentration of our second reactant, O2, raised to its experimentally determined order, which is assumed to be one. When there's no exponent written, we always assume that the exponent is one for reaction orders. So this reaction is first order with respect to oxygen. Now the sum of the exponents is 2 plus R1, 2 for the NO order, plus the assumed 1 on the oxygen. 
that makes the reaction overall incorporating both reactants third order. Our main concern in terms of order ultimately is going to be identifying the individual orders or exponent with respect to each reactant. But you will hear occasionally people talking about the overall order of the reaction. And it's important to know that what they're talking about ultimately is the sum of all of the exponents in the rate law. The most common exponents or orders found in rate laws are the whole numbers 0, 1, and 2. So if we're dealing with a general reaction that has a single reactant, A, then a rate law of K times the concentration of that reactant A raised to the 0 power is considered 0 order with respect to A. If the concentration of A is raised to the first power, to the exponent 1, it's first order with respect to A. And if it's raised to the exponent 2, then it's second order with respect to A. Now, the exponents in rate laws can take on other number values both negative and positive, as well as fractional and whole. 0, 1, and 2 are some of the most common exponents that you'll see in rate laws, and as such, they're a really good place to begin. So how do we figure out which exponent or order applies to our particular reaction? The simplest method is known as the initial rates method. And in this method, we run the reaction multiple times or trials. And in each trial, the initial concentration of the reactants is changed. And the initial reaction rate is measured. So that initial reaction rate can be measured either as the average reaction rate or the instantaneous one, as we described in the previous PowerPoint narration. Then the rates and concentration changes between the trials are compared to determine how initial rate changes with respect to the concentration of each reactant. So let's look at an example of this. So here we have a reaction for one reactant, A, transforming into its products. It doesn't actually matter what the products are when we determine the rate law because the rate law is only dependent upon the concentrations of the reactants. That's all we see in our rate law. So that's why I'm not really specifying what the products are in any of these general reactions. This is the general rate law. For this particular reaction, it would be the rate is equal to the rate constant K times the concentration of A raised to an exponent that we're going to leave as the variable N right now. And what we want to do first is determine what value of N fits our particular reaction. So the way that we're going to do this is using um, the initial trials method. So this, in this example, we've run three trials of the reaction and measured the initial rate for each. In trial one, the concentration of A that we started with was 0 0.10 moles per liter, and we measured the initial rate at 0 0.015 moles per liter per second. In trial two, we doubled the concentration of A to 0 0.20 for our starting point. And then we measured that initial rate, and it was 0 0.030 moles per liter per second. Then in trial three, we doubled the concentration again, this time to 0 0.40 moles per liter. And the initial rate we measured under these conditions was 0 0.060 moles per liter per second. What we want to do is pick two trials and compare the rates and initial concentrations. So I'm going to pick trial one and two, 
but you could pick trial two and three or trial one and three. As long as you're consistent in the trials you pick, it should all work out to the same basic exponent. So by consistent, I simply mean that when you set up your ratios, um, if you compare the concentrations of, of trial one and trial three, for example, then you also compare the initial rates from trial one and trial three. So the way that we're going to compare this um, is actually using the rate law as our general uh, defining form for our ratios. So this is the general rate law again, but I've written it in two forms um, and as a ratio. So um, we're doing a comparison between trial two and trial one. I put trial two on top because trial two has the higher rate, and I prefer not to deal with decimals when I reduce these ratios. So this should give me hopefully whole numbers when I reduce the ratios. So we'll do um, on top, we'll take the rate from trial two, and we'll put it over top of the rate from trial one. And we're going to set that equal to the other a ratio of the other half of our general rate law, which is going to be the rate constant times the concentration from trial two raised to the exponent n. And we'll put this over the rate constant again times the concentration from trial one raised to the power n. And we'll actually substitute into this our uh, measured values for each of these. So this becomes our initial rate for trial two over our initial rate for trial one on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we still have K. We haven't uh, determined what that value is yet, so we leave it as K. But we do substitute in our concentrations for trial two and the concentration for trial one. And we leave n as a variable because we haven't yet determined what that exponent is going to be. Next, we're going to simplify everything. So we're going to cancel out everything that we can cancel out and reduce ratios, hopefully, to one number. So we'll start with canceling out our units. Our rate units will cancel out on the left-hand side. And we can also cancel out the uh, rate constant k. k divided by k will reduce to 1. We can also reduce the value of this ratio on the left-hand side. 0 0.030 divided by 0 0.015 is actually a 2 to 1 ratio. So that will reduce to a value of 2. We can also reduce the numbers inside the brackets on the right-hand side. We're going to keep the exponent n on, on the outside, but we can at least reduce 0 0.20 divided by 0 0.10. And what it's going to give us is actually 2.0, since that's a 2 to 1 ratio, raised to the n power. And of course, we also have the 2.0 from our uh, rate comparison on the left-hand side. So what we want to figure out now is what power of n can we raise 2 to that will give us a value of 2. And the only power of n that will give us the same number as our base is 1. So we have to know a little bit about our exponent relationships, uh, what common uh, relationships we get if we raise a, a number to the exponent 1. What will we get if we raise a number to the exponent 0? What will we get if we raise an exponent to the number 2? You should be able to recognize these different relationships. So if we raise a number to the 1 power, it will return the same number on the other side. And so that's how we know that our exponent is 1. And that means that we are first order in this relationship with, uh, with respect to our reactant A.
So let's look at another example. So again, we're going to have three trials with initial concentrations of our reactant of 0 0.10 moles per liter, 0 0.20, and 0 0.40. This time, however, for this particular reaction, our rate, our initial rate, doesn't change, even though we've changed the initial concentration for each of our trials. All right, to figure out the order that applies to this situation, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to pick two trials to compare. And even though I have three trials here, that doesn't mean I have to use all of the data. I only need to compare two trials. I can double check with by comparison some comparing some of the other trials, but it should give me the same order for any two trials that I compare. So we're going to start again with trial one and trial two. And we're going to do the same ratio again. Rate 2 over rate 1 is equal to the rate constant times the concentration from trial 2 raised to the n power. And that will be set over the rate constant times the concentration from trial 1 over uh, raised to the n power. We'll substitute in our actual values for rates from trial 2 and trial 1, as well as our actual values for the initial concentration of A for trial 2 and trial 1. And again, we'll reduce everything that we can. Our units will cancel out. Our rate constants will cancel out. And we'll reduce our, the values of our ratios to 1 on the left hand side for the rate ratio and that's going to be equal to 2 again for the concentration ratio raised to the n power and again we have to know what exponent we can raise our number 2 to to give us a value of 1 and there's only one exponent that you can raise a number to that will return 1 and that exponent is always 0 so this is zero order with respect to A. So let's look at one last example. And as you might guess, this is going to be our second order reaction. So again, we have three trials, but we only really need to compare two of them. And each of these trials have uh, initial concentrations 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4, and initial rates that are measured. So we're going to just be consistent and take trial 1 and trial 2 again and compare those. So we'll do rate 2 over rate 1 is equal to rate constant times the concentration from trial 2 raised to the n power divided by the rate constant times the uh, initial concentration from trial 1 raised to the n power. We substitute in our actual values from trial 2 and trial 1, and we simplify. And this time, our numbers on the left-hand side will reduce to 4, while the numbers on the right-hand side reduce to 2. So we have 4 equals 2 raised to the n power. And here, you have to realize that 4, of course, is the square of 2. So 2 squared equals 4. And our n value is equal to 2. So it's also useful to know your squared relationships. So in the examples I just went through, I showed you how to do the calculations to figure out reaction order, to do the comparisons between rate and concentration. But the truth is, if you recognize the pattern of rate change, you can identify these common orders without necessarily doing the calculations. For example, if you notice that the rate of the reaction is always the same, regardless of the starting concentration, then you have to have a zero order reaction. If doubling the reactant concentration doubles the rate, though, the order has to be 1. In this case, the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of the reactant. And if doubling the reactant concentration quadruples the rate of the reaction, 
then the order of the reaction is 2. The rate is proportional to the square of the concentration. So now that we've determined the exponents or orders for our rate law, we can easily figure out the rate constant k. You just have to substitute data for rate and concentration from one trial into the rate law formula. So let's do that with our first order rate law example. And we're solving for the rate constant k here. So we're just going to rearrange this equation to get k by itself. And this is what we get. Rate is divided by our concentration of A raised to the first power will equal our rate constant K for our first order process. And in this case, we'll substitute in the data for trial one. It shouldn't matter which trial you choose, though. Try it yourself with data from a different trial, and you should get the same value for rate constant. So here it is with the substituted values in. 0.015 moles per liter per second divided by 0 0.10 moles per liter raised to the first power. Now our units for molarity are actually going to cancel out here. Molarity divided by molarity will cancel out and it's going to leave us with units of 1 over seconds or seconds to the negative 1. The rate constant units are worth noting. They do vary with each different order, as seen here. So zero order reactions always have a rate constant of moles per liter per second. That's the unit on that rate constant. First order reactions always have a rate constant with units of seconds to the negative one. And second order reactions always have rate constants with units of moles per liter to the negative one, second to the negative one. All of these can be calculated as long as you include your units in your calculation of the rate constant. So when you substitute in your values for rate and concentration and solve for K. If you're dealing with a more complicated rate law, uh, the units will also be more complicated, so do make sure you include them in your calculations. So all of our previous examples had only one reactant, but how do we determine the rate law when we have more than one reactant present? So you'll still do trials varying the initial concentration and measuring the rate. But for each trial, you have to make sure that you vary the concentration of only one reactant at a time. And then you do a separate comparison of trials for each reactant. So you'll compare, say, trial one and tr two to determine the order for your first reactant and then maybe trial two and trial three to compare the order for your second reactant. You have to make sure when you pick your trials though, that you pick those that only vary in concentration for the reactant you are interested in. So one reactant at a time. Here's an example of a reaction with two reactants, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide. To determine the rate law for this process, we've gone into the lab and run four trials. And between trial one and two, we've doubled the concentration of nitrogen dioxide, but we've kept the concentration of carbon monoxide constant. Then between trial two and trial three, we doubled the concentration of carbon monoxide while keeping the concentration of nitrogen dioxide constant. And finally, in trial four, we doubled the concentration of nitrogen dioxide while having the concentration of carbon monoxide. And for each of these trials, of course, we measure the initial rate for the reaction in order to use in our comparisons.
Now the first thing we want to do is write a general rate law using n and m as variables to stand in for the exponent orders on our reactants. So it's always going to follow this form. It's rate is equal to your rate constant, and then you're going to substitute in whatever your reactants are, their concentrations, raised to those general orders. And we're going to solve for the nitrogen dioxide order separately from the carbon monoxide order. So we're going to do two sets of comparisons here, one for nitrogen dioxide and one for carbon monoxide. And let's start with the nitrogen dioxide. And we need to find two trials in which the concentration of nitrogen dioxide changes, but carbon monoxide does not. Well, experiment one and two certainly fit this bill. But we could also actually use experiment one and experiment four. Either one. For both of those uh, sets of comparisons, the carbon monoxide concentration stays the same, and that's the critical point, so that we can ultimately focus just on the changes in nitrogen dioxide. This way we know that when we see a change in rate, it is only due to the nitrogen dioxide. So we'll choose trial one and trial two, and we'll compare the concentrations and then the rates. So trial two concentration over trial one concentration is 0 0.20 moles per liter over 0 0.10 moles per liter, and it's a two to one ratio. It reduces to two. We don't need to compare carbon monoxide again because carbon monoxide is the same. It's going to cancel itself out. We do need to compare our initial rates, and so when we do that, rate 2 divided by rate 1, 0.0082 divided by 0 0.0021 is approximately a fourfold difference. Okay, now we need to determine what power the concentration factor must be raised to to equal the rate factor. So our concentration ratio was two, our rate ratio was four. We know we raised the concentration to the n exponent, so we put this into the form of two raised to the n power equals four. Well, the only value of n that will give us four in this relationship is two. This reaction is second order with respect to NO2, nitrogen dioxide. We're not done though. We do have to repeat this process for the other reactant, carbon monoxide. So again, we're going to pick two trials, but this time we're gonna focus on carbon monoxide and we're gonna pick two trials in which only carbon monoxide changes. So that's going to be experiment two and experiment three. All right, so our NO2 nitrogen dioxide is constant, carbon monoxide doubles, and then we're going to look at what happens to our rate. So we can do this mathematically by doing a comparison. We know carbon monoxide doubles. The ratio between 0.2 and 0.1 is equal to 2. If we do the ratio for the rates, well, 0.0083 is pretty much exactly the same as 0.0082, just a little bit higher, but not much. This reduces in terms of ratio to approximately one. The difference is probably just an experimental uncertainty difference between the two. Since the rate remains constant, Despite the change in concentration of carbon monoxide, we know that the order is going to be zero. So the only exponent that we can raise two to that will return one is going to be zero. So now that we have orders for our two reactants, we can substitute these exponents 
back into the general rate law we wrote at the beginning. So rate is equal to the rate constant K times the nitrogen dioxide concentration raised to the N times the carbon monoxide raised to the M. That was the general rate law. Here we've substituted in the orders that we solved for M and N. And since carbon monoxide is raised to the zero power, this is always going to simplify to one, regardless of what our concentration of carbon monoxide might be. And this means that our rate for the reaction really only depends on the concentration of nitrogen dioxide. So we can write a simplified rate law as the rate equals the rate constant K times just the concentration of nitrogen dioxide raised to the second power. And last but not least, we calculate the rate constant K by substituting the concentrations and rate from any one of the trials into the rate law. So here we're going to use the data from experiment one and substitute it into our simplified rate law. So this is the uh, initial rate, 0 0.0021 moles per liter per second. It's equal to K times our concentration of nitrogen dioxide, 0 0.10 moles per liter raised to the second power. If we solve for K, we end up with the 0 0.0021 divided by 0 0.01 moles per liter squared. So in terms of our units, this is actually the moles per liter in our rate is going to cancel out with one of the moles per liter in the squared concentration. It's going to leave us with a final unit that is one over seconds times one over moles per liter. The way we usually write this more complicated unit is moles per liter to the negative one times seconds to the negative one. And of course, the, uh, the numbers reduce 0 0.0021 divided by 0 0.01 to 0 0.21 moles per liter to the negative one times seconds to the negative one for the value of our rate constant K. And again, you should be able to pick any of the other trials and substitute them into our general rate law and solve for K and get pretty much the same value. To summarize, the initial rate method of determining rate laws. First, we do multiple experimental trials for the reaction that we're interested in making sure to change the initial concentration of one reactant at a time between the trials. And for each trial, we measure the initial rate. We then compare the trials to determine the relationship between initial concentrations and initial rates. This gives us the order. And once we have the orders, we substitute data for one trial back into the rate law and solve for K.